Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our Research in Progress webinar today. Our topic today is Adolescent ASICs, a multi-state randomized control trial to increase adolescent immunization through vaccine provider best practices. Our presenters today are Melissa Gilkey, who is an assistant professor at the in the Department of Health Behavior at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health, and Jennifer McKinnon, who is a project coordinator at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. Melissa and Jennifer, would you like to start us off? Great. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, before I get started, this is uh, Melissa Gilkey, by the way. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to acknowledge the study team. So um, the research that Jen, uh, Crystal, and I will present today reflects the work of a lot of people, including Noel Brewer and Jennifer Lehman at UNC, uh, William Callow at Penn State, and our um, really exceptional state health department partners in Washington, Illinois, and Michigan. Now this study is meant to address um, what's a really pressing problem facing the field of cancer prevention. How can we support primary care providers to improve the delivery of HPV vaccine? HPV vaccine is a powerful prevention tool, but we're not currently using it as effectively as we could. And so I want to begin by giving you just a little bit of background to contextualize the problem. Now, until recently, um, HPV vaccination consisted of a three-dose series administered over a six-month period of time. Um, it's been part of the routine immunization schedule for girls since 2006 and boys since 2011. It's targeted to ages 11 to 12, so that's what's considered on-time vaccination. Older adolescents and young adults who are not up to date can receive the vaccine on a catch-up schedule, so up to age 26 for girls and men who have sex with men, and up to age 21 for other males. I should note that the guidelines for HPV vaccination recently changed, so that for younger adolescents, we've now gone from a three-dose schedule to a two-dose schedule. But keep in mind that all of the research I'll present today was conducted with the three-dose recommendation, so that's going to be our focus. Now, unfortunately, we're unlikely to see the full benefits of HPV vaccination here in the U.S. because our coverage remains low. So this graph shows adolescent vaccination coverage um, for 13 to 15-year-olds over time. So that we can see that two other vaccines recommended for this age group um, Tdap in the dark green and meningococcal vaccine in the light green have made this really steady progress towards the Healthy People 2020 goal, uh, which is for 80% coverage. So for both vaccines, we've now met that goal. 88% of kids ages 13 to 15 received Tdap in 2016, and 82% received meningococcal vaccine. By contrast, you can see that we have a long way to go for HPV vaccines. So the red lines at the bottom of the graph show series completion for girls and then for boys. So for 13 to 15 year olds, coverage has reached just 37% for girls and 29% for boys. Now I mentioned the new Tudo schedule. So if we were to use those criteria to look at vaccination coverage, these numbers do look a little better. So they bring HPV vaccination coverage for girls to 45% and coverage for boys to 36%, but we're still a long way off from our goal of 80%. So the takeaway message here is really that our experience with other vaccines suggests that it is possible to vaccinate adolescents, but there's just something different about HPV vaccine. So what's the problem? Well, a lot of recent research has focused on the role that healthcare providers play in communicating about HPV vaccination. So as we know, for a lot of preventive services, a provider's recommendation is a strong predictor for uptake. Kids who receive a recommendation for HPV vaccination have somewhere in the neighborhood of nine times higher odds of getting vaccinated compared to those who don't. Our research suggests that the quality of that recommendation also matters. So in this graph, the bars show the percentage of parents um, who report their adolescents have received HPV vaccine. Uptake is very low for parents who have not received a recommendation at all, as shown in the blue bars. And it's higher for those who received what we call a low recommendation, a, a low quality, excuse me, recommendation. So that, that's shown in the red bar. So this is a recommendation in which the provider does say that the child should get the vaccine, but doesn't necessarily describe it as very important or recommend getting it that day. 
And then, as shown in the green bars, HPV vaccination is even more common among kids whose parents get a high-quality recommendation. So the provider says the vaccine is very important and recommends getting it that day. So the bottom line here is that what providers say really matters. A lukewarm recommendation appears to be better than nothing, but a high-quality recommendation is better still. Unfortunately, we also have evidence to suggest that provider communication about HPV vaccination needs improvement. So first, recommendations are not as frequent as we would like them to be. Based on parental report, somewhere around a third of adolescent girls and over half of boys don't receive a recommendation despite being age eligible. Second, even when providers do recommend HPV vaccine, they may not be delivering high quality recommendations. So for example, in a study of um, primary care providers, uh, pediatricians and family physicians, we found that about half reported two or more lower quality communication practices. Again, such as saying the vaccine is only somewhat important um, that likely um, prevent them from uh, delivering HPV vaccine according to guidelines. So if provider communication is a key barrier, how do we reach out to providers and help them improve the recommendation and address other problems such as scheduling uh, that may be getting in the way of guideline consistent vaccine delivery? Well, one promising approach to intervention lies in our national AFIX program. So AFIX stands for Assessment, Feedback, Incentives, and Exchange. And it's a quality improvement program that's coordinated by the CDC and delivered by state and regional health departments to primary care providers throughout the US. AFIX is based on a strategy of what's called assessment and feedback, in which an immunization specialist from the health department visits primary care providers in their offices to share information about how the clinic is doing in terms of immunizing its patient population. Health department staff may deliver training to providers or other resources to incentivize improved performance. Then after five or six months, the health department gets back in touch with the clinic to give updated coverage estimates to let providers know how their quality improvement efforts are working. Now from a PHSSR perspective, there are at least two different ways that we can think about AFIX. First, we can think about AFIX as an intervention or this kind of discrete set of activities that health departments conduct with primary care providers. And in this regard, we have evidence that AFIX is effective for raising coverage for some vaccines. And this evidence comes in a variety of forms. So um, first, assessment and feedback as a quality improvement strategy is supported by a large body of research, including RCTs, as this way of increasing coverage for early childhood and adult vaccines. So based on this research, the Community Preventive Services Task Force recommends assessment and feedback as a best practice. We also have evaluation studies of the broader AFIX intervention itself. And this research provides evidence that AFIX is effective for increasing coverage for early childhood vaccines. So there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic that AFIX can improve HPV vaccination coverage, but a real limitation of the existing literature is that we don't have much evidence as to the impact of assessment and feedback on adolescent vaccination specifically. Another factor to keep in mind when we think about AFIX as an intervention is that it's not just one thing. So this is a really dynamic program that has continued to grow and change over time. Now there's a second way to think about AFIX, which is as a system. So CDC recommends that health departments conduct AFIX with at least a quarter of their vaccine providers each year. And we know that some states implement AFIX even more broadly than that. So this is a program that reaches a huge number of primary care clinics each year. And in that way, we can think of AFIX not just as an intervention, but also as a kind of highway for delivering quality improvement programs. So we have the existing infrastructure, including a national public health workforce um, that we can use to conduct immunization quality improvement on really a pretty massive scale. Now, from an implementation science perspective, it can be helpful to think about AFIX in the context of Wandersman's interactive systems framework. So the ISF proposes that you really need at least three systems to successfully deliver evidence-based interventions like HPV vaccination. First, you need people at the front lines in the prevention delivery system. And in our case, this would be primary care providers in pediatrics and family medicine who deliver the vast majority of HPV vaccine doses in the US. 
To guide their work, we also need a translation system. Um, and this is typically made up of researchers who generate and summarize evidence. So in the case of HPV vaccination, the translation system is responsible for summarizing the literature to identify strategies like high quality provider recommendations that the prevention delivery system can use to work more effectively and more efficiently. But what the ISF points out as well is that those two systems alone often are um, not in and of themselves sufficient. So ideally we also need an intermediary system, um, which they call the prevention support system that kind of carries evidence from the translation system to the prevention delivery system, usually by providing training, technical assistance, and tools aimed at building capacity. And that's where um, we can think about AFIX really coming in. So the role of health departments and the AFIX workforce is to provide really exactly that kind of implementation support by visiting primary care providers, bringing them the evidence, and helping them to improve their vaccine-related communication and delivery systems using training, uh, technical support, and then also assessment and feedback. So the question then becomes, how do we use that quality improvement infrastructure for vaccines like HPV vaccine that really need it the most? So that question inspired our collaboration with the North Carolina Immunization Branch in 2011. Um, together we designed a three-arm randomized controlled trial with 91 high-volume primary care clinics. We randomized clinics to receive an adolescent AFIX delivered in person in the traditional way, uh, an AFIX visit delivered by interactive webinar, or no AFIX visit for our control. So here we wanted to understand whether AFIX worked to improve adolescent vaccination, but we also wanted to try out a novel delivery mode, interactive webinar, to try to expand states' options for delivering these visits. Our sample included 53 pediatric clinics and 38 family practice clinics, serving a total of over 100,000 patients ages 11 to 18. So here we can see our main outcomes for HPV vaccination at five-month follow-up. So on this graph, we see um, cover vaccine coverage changes by study arm for girls, who were the particular focus of this study. These bars represent the number of percentage points by which immunization coverage in each study arm improved for patients at least ages 11 to 12. So we see the control arm in the blue, the in-person arm in the red, and the webinar arm in the green. Now for HPV vaccine initiation, meaning receipt of one or more doses um, shown by the cluster of bars on the left, we found a statistically significant intervention effect um, at five months follow-up, although it was modest, so uh, one and a half to two percentage points over the control. And it looked like the in-person and the webinar arms performed um, pretty similarly. So um, we would have liked to have seen more impact here, but all in all, this was fairly good news for a light touch intervention. We did get some intervention effect, and we saw some evidence to suggest that webinar is a promising delivery mode. Unfortunately, an analysis that we conducted of outcomes at one year, as shown by the cluster of bars on the right, uh, suggests that the, those improvements that we saw at five months didn't last. So at five months, we no longer saw an advantage in the intervention arms. Um, now keep in mind that these pilot data are now about six years old, and um, you know both HPV vaccination coverage and the AFIX program itself have changed uh, considerably over that time. So, um, you know this is a, a pilot study, and certainly not the last word in terms of AFIX effectiveness. But it did provide us with some important clues, and this was specifically that the idea of um, maximizing AFIX impact for HPV vaccination might require some kind of extra boost. And that brings us um, to the current trial through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We were awarded funds in 2013 for a study that again had the goal of improving HPV vaccination coverage. Our goals were to identify challenges to conducting HPV vaccination quality improvement, to develop AFIX tools and strategies that were responsive to those challenges, and then to evaluate the resulting AFIX visits in a randomized control trial. So as I mentioned earlier, the research team at UNC conducted this work um, in really close collaboration with immunization program staff at three state health departments, Washington, uh, Michigan, and Illinois. And our partners were responsible for delivering our AFIX 
intervention to primary care providers, but they also on the front end and, and really throughout the project played a key role in developing and testing our tools and strategies as well. So together we developed a modified version of an AFIX visit that has three main steps. So with AFIX, first health departments schedule clinics to participate, and here we introduced CME credit as an incentive to bring more providers to the table. Because improving provider recommendations is really key to increasing coverage, we wanted to involve as many providers as possible. In the second step, health department staff deliver AFIX visits to providers, either in person or by webinar. And here we introduced a number of tools for communicating the problem of low HPV vaccination coverage and also setting a specific measurable goal for improvement. And in the last step of the intervention, health departments followed up with clinics at three and six months after the visit to give them progress reports about how their HPV vaccination coverage was changing. So just to give you a sense for what our intervention looked like, here's one of our tools. Uh, this is the immunization report card. Uh, the first section is designed to share coverage estimates for the three adolescent vaccines, um, placing particular emphasis on HPV vaccine. The second section provides progress reports at three and six months so that providers can see their goal and kind of track their progress towards meeting it. And then the third section offers information on how to improve HPV vaccination coverage through effective provider recommendations. We conducted our um, RCT with 224 primary care clinics, and our study design was based on the North Carolina trial, so it will look familiar. Uh, within each state, clinics were assigned to receive AFIX visits delivered in person, um, an AFIX visit delivered by interactive webinar, or no AFIX for the control. We then followed these clinics for a year to assess changes in their HPV vaccination coverage. This table shows key sample characteristics. Um, participating clinics were in all three partner states and were selected to have at least 500 adolescent patients. Um, and this was because uh, CDC prioritizes higher volume clinics to receive, F, uh, to receive AFIX in the hope of um, really maximizing the reach of the program. So 60% of our clinics were pediatric clinics and 40% were family practice clinics. Our primary outcome was change in HPV vaccine initiation at six month follow up among adolescents ages 11 to 12. So those who are in the target age range for vaccination. But we also wanted to assess coverage at 12 month follow up to understand whether our intervention could overcome that washout that we saw in the North Carolina trial. We also evaluated a wide array of implementation outcomes, and these were related to fidelity, um, provider satisfaction and engagement with AFIX, and the delivery cost for state health departments. So here are our main outcome findings. Um, these bars again show the number of percentage points by which HPV vaccine initiation changed over the study period for each trial arm. So at six months post-intervention, we found a statistically significant improvement in HPV vaccination coverage for adolescents in clinics that received in-person AFIX versus no AFIX. Now, similar to our North Carolina trial, the difference was small, so about one and a half percentage points over the control. At six months, we did not see a statistically significant difference for webinar AFIX versus control. Now at 12 months, um, and that's which is shown by the cluster of bars on the right, the coverage difference in the in-person arm persisted. And we also saw a small advantage emerge for um, clinics that were in the webinar arm when compared to the control. So this was different from the North Carolina trial in which we saw no intervention effect by 12 months. I'd also like to share some data on implementation outcomes. So this graph shows data on providers satisfaction with the AFIX visits they received. Um, and here we're looking at three key measures, how well the visit was facilitated, um, convenience for providers, and also the ease of understanding the, the tools and the materials that um, were used in the visit. The red bars show responses given by providers who received in-person visits, and the green bars show responses for those who received webinar visits. 
Now our goal going in was to achieve mean scores of at least four on a five-point scale, and you can see that we met that goal for all three measures and in both conditions. So the intervention really achieved a, a fairly high level of satisfaction among providers, which we think is important because, again, the available evidence really suggests that changing HPV vaccination coverage is going to require engaging frontline providers and convincing them to change the way that they talk about the vaccine. In addition to satisfaction, um, we also used provider surveys before and after the AFIX visit to assess changes in intermediate outcomes. So here, we wanted to know whether our AFIX visits changed providers' perceptions about, how, uh, about whether HPV vaccination quality improvement is important, um, whether low coverage in their clinic is a problem, whether they believe their clinic can improve, and whether they believe that they themselves can be part of that quality improvement effort. So, so kind of trying to get to their, um, their QI self-efficacy, if you will. So in this graph, the light blue bars show what providers said before the AFIX visit, and the dark blue bars show what, what they said after the visit. Here we found statistically significant increases for three of our four variables. HPV vaccination coverage is lower than I'd like, our clinic can improve, and I can help. Um, now, I should note that these data are for all of our intervention clinics combined, um, but we didn't see any differences in stratified analyses between in-person and webinar AFIX. So on intermediate outcomes related to provider perceptions, the two modes appear to perform um, similarly. And again, these measures speak to our goal of communicating a problem and increasing provider self-efficacy to address that problem. Finally, we compared the in-person and webinar delivery modes on other measures, including um, both reach and delivery cost. First, we found that in-person AFIX reached more providers per clinic, with in-person visits attracting nine participants on average, compared to five per clinic in the webinar arm. Now, I should note that both arms achieved higher reach than our North Carolina trial, which um, was typically delivered to just one person in the clinic. So it may be that our CMEs were effective in attracting more providers to AFIX visits. However, in-person AFIX ultimately outperformed webinar on reach. Now, not surprisingly, webinar AFIX cost substantially less to deliver. So webinars required only about two-thirds of the staff time per clinic and in turn um, were about two-thirds cheaper than in-person visits overall. So webinar AFIX cost $461 per clinic on average compared to $733 per clinic for in-person. Um, so a really substantial cost savings, um, which was primarily due to eliminating staff time uh, and other expenses related to um, state health department staff having to travel from their offices to the clinics. So to sum up, we found that our HPV vaccine-specific version of AFIX was able to demonstrate lasting benefits to clinics, although as in our prior, prior study, um, the advantage was fairly small. So it's helpful to keep in mind that we assess changes in coverage, um, which is a conservative measure in the sense that includes both patients who were and were not seen in the clinic during the study period. Compared to our prior trial, we found less consistent evidence of webinar effectiveness. So although the two delivery modes compared favor favorably in terms of um, provider satisfaction and positive changes in providers' perceptions, webinar AFIX reached fewer providers on average, which may help to explain our outcomes. Um, given the reduced cost of webinar AFIX, we believe that future research is needed to understand how to maximize the reach of this delivery mode, um, because it, it really has a, um, a, a lot, some important implications for um, increasing the number of clinics that um, can receive AFIX visits. Similarly, there continues to be a need for research to understand how we can increase the impact of AFIX overall. So this is always a really tricky question because AFIX is designed to be a light touch intervention and one that can be implemented nationally. And so the prospect of increasing um, the intensity has to be done carefully to, to kind of try to maintain efficiency.
In terms of next steps, um, our RWJF funding has supported a number of great dissemination activities that we will continue over the next year. Uh, most notably, Jen has led the development of a website called HPVIQ, which you can find at hpviq.org. And this website is designed um, primarily for immunization staff and health departments and other people who conduct immunization quality improvement programs with primary care providers. Um, the site includes our tools, uh, a step-by-step -step guide for delivering our interventions, and also our publication and presentation and presentations, and these are all freely available for downloading. We were also recently funded by CDC to conduct a follow-up study in which we will evaluate strategies for increasing the impact of AFIX uh, through strategies such as um, what they call physician-to-physician -physician engagement. So this refers to the use of physician educators who will specifically uh, seek to engage other physicians and vaccine prescribers uh, in the AFIX process. And um, in conclusion, conclusion, I would just like to reiterate that from an implementation science perspective, AFIX is really an opportunity. Um, it provides us with an existing implementation support system uh, that we can use to translate research evidence into improved vaccine delivery. Our team looks forward to continuing to test new ways of maximizing the effectiveness and the efficiency of that system in the coming years. So um, I'd like to conclude here so that we can hear from our commentators, but um, Jen and I will rejoin later for the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks so much. We've got two participants who agreed to provide comment here for today's presentation. The first is Phil Huang. Phil is the, uh, on the Systems for Action National Advisory Committee. He's also the Medical Director and Health, and Health Authority for the Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department <coughs> in Austin, Texas. And uh, Crystal Averett is the AFIX and Quality Improvement Coordinator in the Office of Immunization and Child Profile in Washington State Department of Health. Um, Phil, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to comment on this. Uh, this is a very important issue that we in Texas are certainly uh, prioritizing. It's interesting with our Texas Medical Association, uh, we have multiple committees that have uh, identified HPV vaccination as, as top priority. So it includes the, you know, cancer com the Committee on Cancer, our Committee on Infectious Disease, our Committee on Adolescent and School Health, as well as our Public Health and Science Committee. And so it's, it was interesting that all four of them sort of separately identified we want to move the needle on HPV vaccination and are working together to try to do that, as well as it's one of the top priorities for our state cancer coalition. Uh, so, so again, I think the studies and this information is very important. Um, I think, you know, uh, um, in terms of the intervention, uh, somewhat, you know, there are some improvements, but it, it's certainly a little uh, disappointing to see the, the level of impact on behavior. I, I wasn't clear, I mean, what it shows to me, I guess, uh, in terms of what the actual X part of the affix, uh, the exchange of information and resources, you know, how much uh, content or other best practices or education uh, was included as part of the intervention. I mean, what I see is uh, just providing the uh, feedback on performance, uh, which I, I would th think might have a bigger impact. You know, doctors are very competitive and don't want to, uh, you know, these report cards typically are motivational. I was surprised, again, it wasn't a greater impact. You know, we've looked at um, uh, some of the best practices uh, that have been identified, you know, the Walling study, uh, systematic review of some of the interventions to improve HPV vaccine uptake. And, and just, so I think, um, you know, a fix is one of them, but then the other sort of, it shows to me that then the other systemic uh, system change uh, sort of pieces need to be part of uh, the intervention to try to improve the rates as things like, uh, you know, the, making sure that the data tracking pieces uh, in the EHRs and things are, uh, are up to date and, and provide the information. But it sounds like with the feedback systems that you have, those are in place. But, you know, some of the other um, system changes and process in the clinics, you know, scheduling, um, you know, offering nurse-only appointments for no wait, sort of walk-in hours for the second and third doses of the vaccine, um, you know, implementing immunization visits, extended hours, uh, you know, standing orders for nurses to administer the HP vaccine, uh, things like that that might complement then um, uh, what the data feedback 
uh, is. But th that's where I'm not sure, and I you know, have to question how much of that sort of best practice and system change information was part of uh, this intervention. Um, I mean, it's interesting uh, also, uh, again, to, to look at some of the results we've been seeing with some of the other settings. I think that um, they showed school-based vaccine programs were some of the most effective um, in this one review study. But, uh, but again, I mean, I think these, this is very important information for us um, uh, that uh, I think we're all looking to try to improve this because this is certainly an area that we can move the needle. Um, so I think that's, I'd end it there and be ha interested in hearing the comments back. Phil, thanks so much. Uh, Crystal, would you like to provide some commentary? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So Washington State was selected for the uh, PPHF funding uh, for increasing HPV vaccine, vaccine coverage by strengthening adolescent AFIX activities. So this grant wanted us to use one or more of the following approaches, which was using immunization report card, clinician to clinician feedback, webinar-based exchange, offering CME uh, to clinicians. So Washington, who had just completed the project with UNC, decided to implement their approach with this new grant since it met two of the criteria. During the project, Washington State staff did the feedback session. For this new grant, we decided to implement the materials and activities with our local health who do the majority of APEX visits in our state. We are using this grant as a pilot project for what we are referring to as an enhanced APEX visit model uh, with a couple of our local health departments. So we decided to use the materials uh, because the data that we collected from the post-visit survey showed that the vast majority of attendees enjoyed the feedback sessions and were engaged to uh, make some improvements regarding HPV. So in April, we did a training session with uh, those uh, local health jurisdictions that apply to be a part of uh, our pilot project, and we are hoping to roll this model out to the rest of our reviewers by September of 2018. So we adapted the education slides, and uh, we added some Washington-specific data on oral and cervical cancer. Uh, we also uh, created a few more education materials for like monthly emails to address special populations and using the immunization information system to improve rates. Uh, we are also uh, discussing our annual state immunization award called Immunize Washington. In 2017, we created a new uh, award level called the Bronze uh, Status for clinics who have 70% uh, or better for the first dose of HPV. We are also uh, have about three clinics who uh, qualify for the Gold or Silver Status Award for the completion of the adolescent series, which measures 70 to 79% and 80% or better. So we are hoping that clinics participating will be more motivated to go for the bronze award because it's something that they can actually go and reach. Uh, Immunize Washington Award winners receive a certificate signed by the governor, a window cling, and we do a lot of public recognition. Um, overall, we feel the lessons that um, we have learned through this project with UNC has helped improve Washington's a AFIX program, and we want to implement something similar for the Childhood Series in the future. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> Melissa and Jennifer, do you have any, any observations or thoughts about Phil's and, uh, Phil's and Crystal observations? Any thoughts? Any response? Yeah, thank you both so much um, for um, providing those thoughts. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, uh, including other opportunities in addition to assessment and feedback or other strategies for helping providers make changes within their clinics. And um, one of the things I can do is to give a little bit more detail on the AFIX process and the tools and, and strategies um, that we used in this study. So the um, uh, report card that I showed is kind of one, uh, was one tool, and again, that was really meant to help providers um, set a measurable goal and to really track that goal um, over time. So that was kind of the assessment and feedback component. Um, AFIX also uh, typically includes 
um, some provider education um, and uh, around uh, various kind of best practices. The CDC has identified um, 20. So for this study, we try to um, take the study, the, the, to narrow that down a little bit and identify the practices that are kind of most um, promising in the context of HPV vaccination. And we, we created a kind of menu. And then our state partners um, talked through some of these, these options with um, providers in each clinic. Um, they encouraged them to all adopt the goal of improving provider communication and provider recommendations about HPV vaccination since the, the evidence there is really so strong. Um, but they also then had the choice to um, uh, adopt one or more of the other system levels approaches for improving vaccine delivery. Um, so these were things exactly like what you were mentioning, um, standing orders, um, reminder recall, and based on kind of a quality improvement approach, we really left it up to, um, to the providers in each clinic to determine which of those things were most important to them. Um, I think what I have noticed anecdotally is, is difficult about the system level changes is um, even though we have some evidence for each one of them that they're effective, we have um, less evidence typically about providers' ability to pull them off in the context of normal day-to-day -day practice. So for example, that, there's that great study by Allie Kemp's team that suggests that um, you know, one of the things that we recommend most often for doing reminder recall for patients is, is very hard to do in the context of, of regular clinical practice. And if we can kind of centralize that process and, and um, you know, take it to state health departments or some other body, that it can be effective, that it can be um, very cost effective. Um, but that it may not be um, realistic to expect individual providers to do that in the context of their own office. So I bring that up only to say that I very much agree with your point that we do need systems level um, uh, approaches uh, to complement communication education or other strategies like assessment and feedback. Um, but those, I feel like, are not as obvious as they might seem. And we could really use more research on um, which of those are um, most effective and, and most practical, again, in the context of real life practice. You also mentioned um, school-based programs. And in other countries, voluntary school-based programs have been hugely successful. Um, for example, the UK example comes to mind. Um, I think that um, school-based programs here are um, going to have more limited reach, and that's because we don't have a true school system in the U.S. In the, in the sense of having a centralized system that we can feed programs through. There's a lot of control for schools at the local levels. And in the past, that's meant that to conduct an, uh, an HPV vaccine project that you needed to get local support and local buy-in. And that varies so much across the country um, that that tends to not be a very efficient approach. There are also obviously um, school-based health clinics. And that, I think, is a fantastic opportunity um, to deliver vaccines, including HPV vaccine. But again, the reach is pretty limited, so not all school have um, school-based health clinics. So I, again, that's just to say that the, the appeal and the attraction of AFIX is that the reach is huge. I mean, this is this existing system. We have the system. We have the workforce um, to reach a huge number of providers. Um, and it's really unique in that way. And, and that's kind of our interest and our excitement about the program, is if we can find out how to make this work for HPV vaccination, it could really turn the dial in terms of coverage nationally. Yeah, this is Phil. Can I respond? I guess, yeah, I really appreciate those comments. I think that's uh, very helpful. Um, I mean, I, I'm just curious, what in terms of the results, what are you very happy with the magnitude of what you saw or what are your thoughts on that i mean we would definitely have liked to have seen um more impact there's there's no question about that um again we did see improvements in terms of uh of the effect persisting over time so that was a real concern in the first trial and i think um something that's very positive um, but yeah, I mean, the next steps are really how do we, um, 
how do we increase the increase the magnitude of impact? Um, and I also think again that that will have to do in part with also thinking about our data systems. So we used immunization registry data for um, these trials, which is what state health departments typically use to conduct AFIX assessments. Um, and they're they're a phenomenal resource, but they are limited in that you're dealing with vaccination coverage is your denominator. So, you know, there are always a lot of kids in the denominator who are not necessarily um, eligible in the sense that they may or may not have been um, in the clinic. So it, you do end up with um, what are, what are um, probably conservative estimates. Well, I do think it'd be interesting to know what, in terms of, you said you left it up to the clinics in terms of which uh, sort of system level approaches they implemented or found were most important be interested to see how many did get implemented because uh, I yeah I'm, I'm certainly attuned to the difficulties in real life of implementing some of these things but you know how do we balance that approach between trying to get some of those system level interventions and maybe you know combination getting the providers because you know I know they, they've talked about that the um, providers are actually make them uh, more impact on the initiation of the vaccine series but then the follow-up mm -hmm. is getting the patients and so, again, to be thinking about all these interventions and combining and maybe a combination of getting the providers with, you know, I get more cynical about CME and over time, uh, but, you know, getting the, either the, the policies made at the higher levels also in combination with some of the education of the physicians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Crystal, maybe you can speak to CMEs as, um, you know, your experience with, with using them to recruit clinics, because obviously one of the challenges is, is um, getting time with providers. You know, um, I think it, often it's um, a lot of the focus on intervention studies is understandably on the intervention, but the, but that scheduling component is actually really important because just getting in the door is a whole, um, you know, it represents a lot of effort on the health department side. Um, so, Crystal, can you say, can you talk about CMEs and your experience approaching providers and, um, and their interest? Yeah, so one of the things I did was uh, to target is, I know that at least monthly they have a staff meeting. Um, I really target say, hey, can I come speak at your staff meeting? Um, I'm offering you CMEs for allowing me to come and kind of present this quality improvement uh, activity. And I seem to get a lot of buy-in uh, with that because I, I thought that they knew that I wasn't just there to waste their time, that they were receiving something tangible uh, for me coming there. And I had a lot of providers who uh, seemed to enjoy the you know presentation and um, one of the one clinic that I saw that was a community health center, um, which I had every physician, every nurse practitioner, and every PA uh, attending. Uh, they, when they saw the rates, and especially where it broke down between boys and girls, they realized that their boys were not getting um, vaccinated. So, within six months, they had almost tripled their numbers of uh, boys uh, from their goal. And I think there are probably about 80, 90 percent now, still today, of having um, having that uh, dose one HPV uh, level. And this is um, basically a community health center who serves a very diverse uh, part of King County, and they have a lot of people leaving in and out. And we worked about uh, doing strategies about how to inactivate patients in, in their list, so. Um, they're not having all this extra fluff of patients who no longer belong to them. So they were pretty, pretty motivated, along with a few other clinics too. That really. Yeah, I do up. think that that mechanism of getting that CME to them if they've got a meeting where everyone's going to be there is would be highly desirable. That sounds like a great success that way. So, and I can see that same thing with some of our FQHs. And that's it. Yeah, but we're just them checking on the webinar on their own, I just we just don't see that same level of participation. Yeah, this was, um, and I should have clarified that. I apologize. So this was CME credit for for actually attending and participating in the AFIX visit. It wasn't a separate, you know, it wasn't the kind of go online and, and watch a, a canned presentation. Um, but this issue of incentives I also find really interesting. Um, because from, um, you know, if, if you take the perspective of health departments, it is surprisingly hard to, to um, 
uh, think about really motivating incentives, and I'd love to hear others' thoughts about this. But you know, traditional things like um, food that have often been used for research studies, which you know is the the magic way of of um, buying participation. I've learned, really, you know, that, that's increasingly not an allowed expense in in state and federal government. So that is expensive, and it's it, it's also kind of often an expense that's off the table. Um, you know. Um, uh, plaques and different and recognition and that sort of thing I think um, can can be effective so um, you know if we can have um, kind of creative thinking in that regard um, but it, it but from the if it's from the state health department it really has to be a, a, a very cost effective um, way of, of motivating participation and, and recognizing participation because there just isn't the funding to um, give people money or food or the things that in research we typically use to get them to the table. We, we had um, one of our local health, uh, what they did is they got a grant from a like, group house, health foundation and they did a mass AVIX visit where they had like all the clinics come in and they provided, um, because this wasn't state or you know, federal funding, they, could, they bought dinner, they had raffles, they got you know, things like data loggers uh, for their clinic, for their vaccine. Um, they did like this six month intervention uh, using a different type of grant to, and this was HPV uh, specific. All right, great. Um, we have time for questions. Um, so our first question is from uh, Michelle Bailey, who's made an observation. She says that if you look at, I believe she's referring to slide 33. Um, if you look at um, kind of the cost per provider, um, it seems like uh, in-person is actually cheaper per provider than via webinar. So do you have any thoughts about kind of the cost and benefits associated with both of those uh, modalities? That's right. Yeah, I mean, it really de it depends on kind of um, what are you uh, thinking about as the as the outcome. I mean, in that way, um, it, you know, in person um, it was kind of it, what really was the reach of in person that was the advantage. And so the the question then becomes, um, can you increase webinar to to get the same reach? Um, you know, as an, as I noted in the talk. Um, our states did amazing with reach. So in our North Carolina trial, it was really one, um, you know, the the intervention was really being delivered to one person in the clinic. And so they were able to raise those numbers substantially, but it did look like in-person um, did a better job of that. Um, and, you know, we've we've talked some about why that, that might be. So, um, you know, for uh, when you show up in person in somebody's office, there might be um, more kind of a social incentive to um, participate. It may be that it's easier in person to kind of round people up and, and get them into a conference room versus, you know, finding enough com computers or that sort of thing. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it did look like in terms of reach that um, the, the in person really outperformed the webinar um, okay. format. And Melissa, I can uh, definitely I, I, say that more people on the webinar, uh, they would cancel last minute uh, where I had no one uh, cancel in person. So um, I think that social aspect that you're coming out, you're traveling to their clinic, they were not going to um, cancel on you, whereas webinar I had people not show up or, oh, you know, we couldn't make it. Um, I saw that a couple times. I do think it's interesting if you look at um, like Melissa said, it, it depends on the outcome that you're considering. And if you look at what our results were at six months and then at 12 months, um, you see that in, at six months, the in-person was more effective at increasing the um, vaccination coverage. And so in, in that case, it does seem to be more cost effective to do the in-person. But at 12 months, we saw that the webinar was, was just as effective. And so um, that kind of per person cost savings, I think kind of goes away at, at 12 months and um, and if you look at just you know vaccination coverage it, it, um, you know then it does point to webinar being a good um, use of, of money if you're looking at just that vaccination coverage rather than per person reach all right 
Great. We've got another question. Jennifer Harmon asks, um, are you familiar with the HPV vaccination QI learning collaborative run by the National Immunization Partnership with the APA out of Vermont and the National Improvement Partnerships Network? Um, she says that this sounds like a very similar approach to those efforts. Um, how does APEX's approach differ? And Crystal, I know that you that you are really familiar with both programs, which are um, and and have experience with both programs. Could you speak to that? Yes. Um, so a little bit different with the the Vermont um, approach is not different. They use different materials. Um, we actually have a few states or a few providers in our clinic. Um, I've worked with them lately. Uh, they, matter of fact, they came out to the training that we did uh, that Jim McKinnon. Uh, came out when we were kind of implementing this. Uh, they came out and did a QI training. Um, they were offering, um, I think University of Vermont was offering um, maintenance of certification um, credits for uh, board certified pediatricians and family practice. So just a little bit different incentive of how they got uh, clinics motivated. Did they All seem right. to get better rates of participation with that, with the maintenance of certification? I would think that might be a better incentive. We don't know because, I mean, th these are still, um, I think the six months is coming to the end, so we won't have that information. We were the third cohort uh, to work with them, and I think they're going to do a fourth cohort next year and target a few more providers. So we're kind of working. Um, we have a lot of different people who do um, quality improvement activities to this uh, state, and as the uh, state lead, I'm trying to figure out who's seeing who. We have, like we have a health plan partnership; they do a lot of quality improvement. We have the Transformation Clinical Practice Initiative. Um, people who do offer also M MOCs. Uh, so we're trying to collaborate all these QI and target with AFIX. Um, because one thing that we know is that providers are just being hammered down with different quality improvement, you know, increase this, do this. So um, at least for immunizations, we're trying to work at, at it as a systems approach as, you know, we go in, you know, maybe three partners want a, this provider to increase the rates. We're going in as a, like a whole, you know, instead of three different entities wanting to do three different projects. So we're trying to work on uh, this QI collaboration. And I really like this um, series of questions because you know we also thought about an, an MOC approach. Um, Crystal, how do you how, do you feel like um, doing uh, providing MOCs is would that be um, something that's doable in the context of a, a health department? So it's very expensive to do. We looked into it. Um, it's definitely a lot more than doing CME. Um, however, the it, I think it's the Indiana Immunization Action Coalition already has this set up, um, and it's for HPV, and it's $50 uh, for the provider to participate. So either, you know, Clint, um, health departments or, uh, you know, state health departments could go that way and just pay the $50, you know, fee for them um, instead of trying to set this up. Um, for us, because we have the TCPI, um, they already do MOCs for both childhood and uh, adolescent AFIC. Um, we wouldn't go that route because we could work with them to if providers were interested. And it's uh, I know it's one, a, have, oh, go ahead. Okay. So we have probably one time for one last question. Brian Dixon has asked, "Do you believe that the clinical decision support built into the provider's EHR might lead to a more sustainable improvement in vaccination rates over time. Any thoughts about that? Uh, my understanding is that um, that EHR decision support, um, had, that there's kind of variable evidence behind it, that there's some evidence to suggest that it does um, in, in conjunction with education and assessment and feedback and some other um, interventions that it, it can increase um, HPV vaccine initiation. Um, so I, um, uh, you know, I, I'm optimistic that it would, um, that it's an effective tool. 
Um, and I think there's some good research um, currently going on that will um, give, it, give us better insight into that. I, I think like a lot of things, it, it sometimes comes down to these um, implementation science questions in terms of how you do it. Because uh, I've also heard providers say, um, as Crystal mentioned, that they're, that they're getting to this point of real overload um, with um, strategies like that, that there is an alert for, um, for just about everything. And, and if it's not um, helpful or if it's kind of um, overdone, then what happens is it just becomes ignored. So I think it's, you know, as is always the case, the devil is in the details, right? It is, um, like how do you how do you implement that um, in a way that's most effective? Uh, can I ask one more thing? This is Phil Wong. Please can, go ahead. can I ask one more thing? In terms of your yeah. report card, um, you, you provide the report card back to that clinic, but have you had a comparison thing for them to be motivated to try to beat or something, some reference? You mean in terms of having them try to beat another um, practice in their state or something like that? Yeah, or some either in more um, provider specific report cards or something else that gives them that com competitive piece to it. Yeah, that's just, that's, I have a lot, um, I would love to know how, so this was obviously clinic um, level assessment and feedback, and I would love to know how that compares to um, uh, individual provider level assessment and feedback. Unfortunately, that's not um, possible with immunization registries, or at least the ones that we've worked with at this time. Um, so there, you know, we just don't have the, I, I think that you really need um, EHR data um, to pull that off. So it was not a, a possibility in, um, in this context, but um, I, I think it's a really exciting question. In terms of um, kind of benchmarking clinic performance against other, um, against other measures, you know, one of the things that's often done with, uh, for example, early childhood vaccines is to compare a clinic's performance against the state or national average. And our um, concern about doing that for HIV vaccination is that um, coverage is pretty low. And the formative research that we did suggested that that had a tendency, um, showing those estimates had a tendency to not to motivate people, but to normalize low coverage. So people would look at the state and say, oh, well, you know, nobody's really doing that well. So it, it's it's just, it's really not a problem. That's just how HPV vaccination is. So we wanted to specifically avoid that type of comparison, um, but I, I agree that um, trying to compare clinics within uh, a state or, or area could be really interesting. So that is actually happening. Um, <clears throat> CDC uh, working with uh, several immunization registry companies, um, including the one that we are using. Uh, is developing this what's called the SMART AFIX tool, and it will group providers who have the same population and rank them. Uh, so they'll know if they're the first or they're last, um, and if, you know, uh, depending on their uh, population. So you know, if they have 100 kids, they'll be ranked among people in that cohort. So that is actually coming out, um, probably be implemented next year in 2018. Yeah, I think that sounds very interesting. Well, great. Thanks for your time today. We've reached the end of our webinar. Um, for an archive of this webinar as well as our past ones, you can get them on the URL at the top of your page. Here's a list of our upcoming webinars. Um, if you have any questions about um, our webinars, please feel free to contact Ann Kelly at the web ad email address below. Thank you.